of all, I want to recognize our sponsors, uh, Mr. L and Carmen Castellano. And I also want to recognize that we have uh, Senor Jose Loreto, who is El Consul Ascrito de Mexico. That means he's the Deputy Consul de Mexico, Senor Loreto. I also want to recognize the hard work that's been done here by Elisa Echeverria. Where's Elisa? She's the uh, transition manager of this facility. So whenever you get, want to have a party here, talk to Elisa. She'll lend you the keys and let you in free. Uh, I also want to recognize some people who I, I haven't met, but through talking to Elisa and a little bit of email, uh, I wanted to recognize Mr. Mark Coronado. I don't know if he's here, but I know he has everything to do with the students who came from De Anza. He's been planning this for a while. <laughs> and then uh, we also have from De Anza uh, Jorge Morales, and we have Alicia Cortez from the Puente program at De Anza. <laughs> but then we have from Cal State Monterey Bay. Is there anybody here from Cal State Monterey Bay? <laughs> and we want to thank Eva Silva. Eva, where are you? For uh, arranging all this. So thank you very much. Lastly, I wanted to ask, is there anyone here who was a Bracero? Anyone here who was a Bracero? You don't have to be very old. You could be a kid like me, you don't have to be 60, 65. Be a bracero. Is there anyone here whose parent was a bracero? Stand up, stand up. If your parent was a bracero, how about grandparent was a bracero? Stand up, stand up. All right. DNA comes from. Okay? okay, without any uh, further comment, I want to introduce today's moderator, and that's Dr. Carlos Navarro, formerly from Cal State Northridge and now uh, Chair of Liberal Studies at National Hispanic University. Dr. Carlos Navarro. Good afternoon. I just wanted to tell the audience that you are in for a great treat. We have here not only many thousands of hours of dedicated service to our community, but a lot of wisdom that comes from that service. So we have four viejos and a, and a young woman here. So, but think for this, this young woman has also done a lot. Uh, so each each of our, our speakers is going to take about. Uh, 15 to 20 minutes to make their presentation. Uh, and we'll start with, with uh, Dr. Camarillo. Then we'll go to our, from Stanford University. Welcome, Dr. Camarillo. Uh, Dr. Gregoria Mora Torres from San Jose State Chicano Studies. Nanette Regua from EDC and De Anza College and the National Hispanic University where I'm from and Alberto Carrillo, a homeboy from, from this area who works with human and a leader in human relations here. So we have a, a great, great group. But most importantly, after they all speak, you're all going to get a chance. We give you, you'll have at least half an hour to have your say, to raise your questions, to make your comments. So without any further stuff, let's just get on with the program. Especially the students. Because I, I want to tell you uh, something about this program. My task as a historian is to, to give some overview to this, what is an untold story in American history. And we have to question why it's an untold story. The largest guest worker program in American history, arguably the largest guest worker program in the world. And yet we know very little about it. So I was delighted when I learned about the Smithsonian Institution, one of our great cultural institutions of American society, right? And they decided to 
put on a tour, a traveling tour, uh, about the Barracero story. And there, and as I understand, there will be a permanent ins installation of this Barracero story, Better Harvest, at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. So if you ever get a chance, um, good, next time in D.C., go to the Smithsonian and see it, because you'll have a much better sense of, um, of the full array of photographs and storytelling about the Barracero program. We're going to touch on a variety of topics today. I'm going to give you a quick overview about where it came from, uh, who were these people, what did they do in the United States, what were the problems with this, this program, and why it, uh, there were so many advocates, including our own Dr. Ernesto Galarza, that wanted to terminate it. So, let me begin. Now, um, two things I want you to think about here. All right, we have, oops, just as I'm talking, it goes out. We have the faces of individuals, of Mexicano workers, Mexican men who came to the United States in search of work. And they came by the, by the first hundreds of thousands and unbelievable legions of people over time. But what happens to them? Their faces become uh, erased and they just become one of a number of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of people who come to do work and they become anonymous. But we always have to remember these are individuals striving to get work in the United States. Okay, this thing will, that we'll link on in just a second and we'll, we'll proceed. Um, the story of, of the, the Bracero program is one of, let's see if we can get this back. The story about the Braceros is this. For dead workers, great migration, the first great migration, 1.5 million Mexican folks come during the period uh, at the time of the Mexican Revolution and after from 1910 to 1930, and they become the backbone of the seasonal agricultural uh, workers in the Southwest. So there was no surprise that when a war emergency occurs, World War II, and there's the war production, not only for the industrial war-related industries, but in agriculture, it must continue. In fact, they have to gear up for even the war-related industries are, are taking people away from the rural areas because there are job opportunities in the cities, like Los Angeles and Oakland and San Jose and other places. Um, and so there's a decline in the number of workers harvesting during the season or permanent agricultural workers because the opportunity now and for Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants is to go to the city. There is a relative substantial decline in the number of Mexican and other agricultural workers during the war. So there was an emergency. There was a manpower shortage and the growers go to the government and say, look, we cannot provide the kind of foodstuffs that we need for the war effort for here and abroad without more labor. And of course, they were going to look to the neighbors to the south, to Mexico. It's not the first time it happened, the Marcelo program, guest worker program. It was actually tried in another war emergency effort in 1917 and 1918 during World War I. But there were multiple abuses and it was, it was terminated in 1919, short-lived. But there was a precedent, in other words, right? So of course, the federal government, the U.S. government would start talking with the, uh, the Mexican, uh, their Mexican counterparts and say, we need a binational agreement that will allow Mexican citizens to come into the United States for a particular amount of time, a particular period of time, to harvest the crops because we need them and we are allies. So, it's clear that there was a long-standing dependence on Mexican workers. This was a war emergency, so it was not a far-fetched idea that despite two decades earlier there had been problems with the guest worker program, that the United States would enter into agreement a guest worker program with Mexico, the birth of the so-called Bracero program. The committees meet in 1942, and they come up with provisions. So you have to understand, when I talk later about the problems and abuses of the program, 
we have to talk about what what were the guidelines? What was it supposed to do? And of course here, there were um, there had to be contracts in, or, in order not to allow the kinds of discriminatory practices that could occur. You want contracts between the employers, farm owners, and the Mexican guest worker uh, guest workers coming through the Rosero program. First thing, and then very important on the on the on the American organized agricultural workers a decade before Cesar Chavez was successful. But Cesar Chavez knew well there's no way the UFW could have happened. Easy the recruitment and then the disbursement of workers across agricultural zones of the West. And I should say, though the vast majority of workers came into American agriculture, there, was, there were hundreds if not thousands of, of Mexican barceros that worked on El Traque, the train, the railroads. And I'll show you in a few minutes uh, evidence of that. But the, the government, so think about it, what a uh, what a gift to employers. The government, the federal government, is going to provide transportation, it's going to provide resources, free of charge to employers. So it, it was boom time for American agriculture. A huge amount of money was being made uh, using Bracero labor. Supposed to provide them housing, good basic housing, decent housing, and sanitary conditions, and prevailing wage, which became a real issue. Because who set those wages? The federal government? Uh-uh. The employers. Okay. The employers set the prevailing wage, and that became one of the most sticky issues with the either the continuation or the termination of the Rosero program in the 1960s. So the, the, the Mexican government sets up, uh, um, and then the, uh, the United States would provide the transportation that would get them to different locales throughout the country. So this was, a, this was an orchestration of a, of a major effort, right? In the war years, 220, I want you to point, point this out. California, throughout the period of the Rosero uh, program, was the major beneficiary. In this period alone, for example, 63% of all our central uh, workers during the war came to California during the prime harvest season. And those that were allowed to remain in the off season, weeding, hoeing, doing all kinds of things, constituted 90% of all our cells. They first came by the hundreds, word of mouth got out. There's a program that if I could get in on it, the Mexicanos were telling themselves, telling each other, uh, I could make three or four times the amount of wage that I could make here in Mexico in our local area. So of course I'm going to try to get on the lists and into the recruiting centers. So they come by the by the, the hundreds, then they come by the thousands, and then the tens of thousands, and the hundreds of thousands. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people coming in every single year to harvest the food that we put on our tables and that was canned and sent to our troops overseas. They came by rail, right, to the recruiting centers. Thousands of them descend on the recruitment contract centers in, in, in Mexico. Uh, all of these scenes are from, from Mexico. But wait a minute. <laughs> This was a war emergency measure. The war was over, and yet you saw the dates, 1964. Wait a minute, we weren't in a permanent condition of war during those years, although there were wars. Why was it? Make the case, after World War II, the people who left before the war have not come back. We're still in need of braceros. So we need to continue this program, otherwise the, uh, the, the, the produce that we have come to won't get in a rotten in the field. So they're making the case we continue to need Russell labor. And then there's another one, the Korean War, 1951. So there's the war measure again, we need more people. So it, it's not difficult to convince Congress because you have some very powerful growers and politicians who support them that say, this is a good thing, it's good for the Mexicans because they are working and they're sending remittances back in the hundreds of millions of dollars 
to their families back in Mexico, and it's good for American culture, it's good for, in California, politicians were singing the praises, right? It's good for the for California economy. So, it's no surprise that year in and year out, but beginning in 1951, Congress authorizes Public Law 78, that for the next many years, will institutionalize the Minnesota program. Again, labor needs during the war, but it extends beyond the Korean War, Korean conflict. Uh, they're supposed to be because there were abuses that were identified during the war years, World War II years, and so the government says, we need to tighten those regulations, we, make it, we have to make it safer, we have to do this and that to make this a, a more institutionalized, uh, more effective program. So there were new provisions placed. Medical care and other resources for the uh, for the Rosetos as they came into the United States and prepared to leave the United States. Um, and this time, though, the federal government realized that they had been giving uh, extraordinary resources to growers. They said, this time, transportation is not free, guys. You better pay for it. In fact, you're going to pay for everything in terms of uh, recruitment, transportation, and infrastructure for the program. So the grower, growers realized this, but it was still a boon to American agriculture because these are folks, they could pay way less than domestic workers, and that became a really sticky issue. Think of the numbers here, folks. I mean, this is, how can this not be in our history textbooks? And if, there, if it's in our history textbooks, it's two sentences. That's got to change. 1951, public law, uh, 78, that year, a little under 200,000 Mexican Rosetto workers were recruited. By 1960, that number went up to 427,000. During the public law, uh, during the 50s, so 51 to 60, 3.4, almost 3.5 million Mexican guest workers had come into the United States. And if you total the entire period, 42 to 64, 4.6 million people from Mexico came to work in the United States. The largest guest worker program ever in the United States and in the world in the 20th century. They worked everywhere. Cotton, onions, tomatoes, carrots, everywhere. They were ubiquitous. They were everywhere in American agriculture. They, and they worked in, in small numbers. Uh, well, this, this, these are scenes from their recruitment. So they, once they came into the United States, so they had to wait, you know, they had to wait their turn. They all had numbers. They were coming in, in by train or across the border by truck. Uh, and they had to be inspected. You know, they had to go through the routine of being inspected. You stripped naked. And the doctors would come and look at your mouth and look and see if you have lice in your hair. And believe this or not, you know what he's spraying on these, these young men? Thank you. Uh, DDT, a banned substance by the 1960s. They were spraying DDT on these young men as they entered the United States. Highly carcinogenic. Okay? That's rarely ever discussed. Supposed to be sanitary and up to standards, but there were so many examples of it. It, it was not. Uh, unsanitary conditions um, reigned just about everywhere. If the workers complained, and they had a right to complain, and it was supposed to be passed on to American officials, those complaints were not heard. And if you complained enough, the grower had the authority, the power, to pick you up and say, you're out of here. And you're gone the next day, right? So you learn not to complain. Extra costs. The workers were supposed to be supported in their transportation and housing and food, but they were never told that anything extra they paid for. So the growers brought in their own commissaries, sold goods to the Maceros at exorbitant prices. So there were other costs that they paid. And yet, importantly, more and more of these young men sign up because it's still an opportunity to make substantially more in the United States than in Mexico. Housing is a uh, photos are from, but working with the short hole, which was a dreadful um, tool in the fields because you had to be over, you know, bending over continuously. You lived in tents for months at a time, relatively small encampments of Montecitos, to very large encampments where hundreds of people would, would sleep and eat. And these are, these are men cooking their own meals on little, uh, little stove tops. To 
throughout the 50s and into the 1960s, there were people that said, look, this is almost, in fact, they were calling it, this was <coughs> slavery in the United States. That the conditions under which these men worked were so bad. They had hired that undercut the wage so that Mexican-American domestic workers in agriculture were not making a go of it. In fact, it caused a lot of tension between the Mexican-American folks and the Braceros, the Mexicanos. Even though they saw themselves as one of the same kind of folk, right? But there were tensions because of, of the, uh, especially the undercutting of the wage. And uh, Ernesto Galarza was leading the charge. He wrote Merchants of Labor about the Bracero story. And he wrote about accidents. And this is what actually came um, as the final blow in the 60s to the Bracero program. I'll end on this note. I want you to think, look at this. this. They're supposed to be transported in safe conditions. This is a truck, a flat bike truck, which they basically built a, a canopy over, and you sat on benches that were not anchored to the, the floor of the, of the truck. Same thing here. They're conveyed in open trucks, uh, no safety. This is a train that plows into 57, oh, let me show you, I told you about uh, agri uh, railroad workers. In Schenectady, New York, in 1963, a gang of Racero track workers were killed in this accident. But the accident that really spelled the doom of the uh, Racero program was the train wreck at Chawla, not far from here in the Salinas Valley. And it was that event in which 32 Mexican workers, guest workers, were killed uh, as their truck crossed the track and the locomotive slammed into it. 23 injured, 32 killed, and the Mexican-American advocacy organizations from Los Angeles and other places were saying, look, this shows us that not just this accident, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Braceros were losing their lives because of the unsafe conditions, transportation. They were breaking out with dysentery and other things. One more, thank you. Um, so this was the opportunity when an accident like this happened, Congressional Investigation, Department of Labor, Department of Interior, with Mexican-American advocacy organizations and American labor unions saying, we've got to put an end to this. This is a program that, yes, there have been some benefits to it for American agriculture and for the Mexicanos who have been working it, but it's rife with problems and abuses. And this is the time to end it. It was this accident that, that uh, precipitated all of the forces that come together so that in Congress, the next time the agricultural interests and the politicians say we want to renew uh, Public Law 78, they said, no, this is it, terminated, end of the guest worker program. But we can't forget that we can look at the numbers of 4.6 million and we can think about you know, the accidents that occurred but these were individual lives. These were, these were people who saw an opportunity to come to the United States for, for a period of time to make some money and go back to Mexico and then maybe sign up the next year. There was no guarantee. Um, and uh, so let's not forget, and I'm glad that we have some descendants of Raceros here, that this was uh, what we call the second wave of migration from Mexico. The first wave was during the Mexican Revolution. But the Braceros are the second wave, and there are so many of them that decided to not, no longer be a Bracero worker and come to the United States, um, naturalize as citizens, uh, and become an important part of the Mex growing Mexican-American community during these decades. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to the, to the rest of the talks from my colleagues. Thanks. And now we'll have uh, Dr. Mona Torres here. Buenas tardes. Professor Camarillo has given you a fantastic uh, overview of the Brazil program. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to focus uh, the rest of the program in relationship to Northern California, specifically Santa Clara Valley, 
Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I want to tell you is that uh, I've been teaching uh, in Next American States for about 20 years. And over this 20 years, I've had uh, dozens of students who have uh, basically who have had grandfathers who were placeros. And basically, every, every one of those kids has told me that uh, their, 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 their grandfathers are very grateful for the fact the United States invited them to come to the United States. And uh, they owe their success to, to, to the Basero program. But one of the things I want to tell you uh, is that that was never really the intent of the Basero program. Um, if you remember, in the 1930s, there was this Great Depression that hit the United States. And all of a sudden, Mexicans became persona non gratas. Uh, they were not wanted anymore. And so you had about 500,000 uh, Mexicans and their families, even a lot of U.S. kids, who were kicked out of the country. And so Mexicans remembered full well the Great Depression as a, as a time of tragedy. A lot of them, a lot of these kids never came back. Well, anyway, in the 1940s, when the United States uh, went through the uh, Second World War, there was an incredible need for workers. Uh, and so I'm going to be uh, using newspaper uh, clippings from the San Jose Mercury Herald and also the San Jose uh, Mercury later on to show you the great need that there was for Mexicans. It is really uh, uh, the American farmers who insist on bringing Mexican workers in Santa Clara Valley to Salinas. And I think that those, 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 those titles will, um, will show you exactly, you know, the, uh, the headlines will show you exactly, you know, the sentiment that a lot of people have towards the Mexicans. So can we start with the first one? Uh, here we have, uh, you know, Mexicans coming to work. And if you look at those pictures, you know, these people are coming, these Brazilians are coming to work with incredible joy. Okay? But one of the things that you need to know is that uh, Santa Clara Valley, in the, in the 1940s, was basically an agricultural valley. Uh, it had uh, orchards that basically uh, had uh, pears, apricots, and all kinds of other fruits. In addition to that, you also have all kinds of vegetables like onion tomatoes. And so you have a need for thousands and thousands of workers. And a lot of these goods are being spoiled. Uh, there's no one to pick them. One of the things that happened was that a lot of the workers that had picked crops in the 1930s all basically went, like Professor uh, Camarillo said, they all went to either where they were drafted or they, were sent, or they, or they found jobs in the, in the, in the, in the war manufacturing industries. So the only uh, people that were left uh, to, to, to work in the fields are actually Mexicanos that are coming from New Mexico, Arizona, okay. Texas, and a lot of them are also moving from Mexico. Yeah, but there's still, even though there are thousands and thousands of these people coming to the Clara Valley, they're not sufficient. And so the need for Mexican braceros is very, very great here in the Santa Clara Valley, but particularly so in Salinas Valley. Um, one of the other uh, curiosities that most people know, uh, don't know about is the fact that in addition to uh, most braceros that came to the United States came in to work in agriculture, but there was a significant number okay, that came to work in the railroads. And I'll tell you that because I'm a, I'm a product of that. My father came to work at Repitas as a, as a railroad placero worker, and he said once in, in San Jose eventually, but there, he, was, he used to tell me that there, were, there would be hundreds of Mexican workers uh, repairing a lot of the, rail, the railroads across Northern California. Here we go next. Um, here you have, uh, look at the, the, the headline, uh, 700 Mexicans coming to, uh, to Santa Clara to, uh, to harvest. This is 1942. Next. Uh, and here, look at that number. 1942, you have 50,000 workers coming in to work in 1942 alone. 1942, you're going to have the same amount. Next. Uh, here's a, a, a story that basically says that Mexicans and Mexicans are coming to, to work in the Gilroy area. See, so they're coming in, and, and, and in actions, the way I see them is basically that they're kind of little armies that come in and basically come in and they, they harvest a the crop and they move on to the next, uh, to the next uh, 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 field or the next uh, orchard. Okay, next. Um, again, uh, there's the image that Mexicans are very happy to come to the United States. In fact, whenever they, this is from, uh, from Stockton, whenever they come to Stockton, they're shouting vivas, you know, we're glad to be here to work and to contribute to the war effort. Next. Uh, again, 
the, 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 the joy that Mexicans had or this plane in coming to, Santa, to, the, to the United States and knowing the bottom picture shows how they're being trained to harvest the sugar beets. Next. Um, oops. Let's go to the next one. Yeah. Okay, uh, again, we have Mexican workers uh, uh, working, uh, I guess they're picking up uh, tomatoes. One of the things that the, the, the newspaper accounts, uh, and I read uh, uh, dozens of them, basically showing 1942, you know, the entire fields of tomatoes being simply plowed over because there's no one to pick them. And, and keep in mind that the war needs every, uh, every bit of food that they can harvest. And here you have uh, pears, apricots, especially uh, tomatoes that are being basically going to, they're, they're, they're getting spoiled because there's no one uh, in the area to pick uh, those crops. Next. You have the peak of the harvest season, and you have again Mexicans hitting that, that peak, okay? And again, it shows uh, quite a few significant people uh, working. Next. Um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the local uh, people tried to do was to feel, to make Mexicans feel welcome. And so they would organize uh, fiestas for them. And so this is something that nobody really hears about. Most of the people, most of the time we see people uh, living out in the camps. And in reality, you know, the local people try to do events for, for the Mexicans to come in and basically feel like they're welcome. So next. Um, but already in 1942, 1943, uh, people are already saying, do, do we need Mexicans? Uh, uh, how many can we have? And so a lot of them begin to posit the idea that maybe the Brazilian program is not the total cure to resolve the problem of, uh, of a shortage of workers in our culture. Next. Um, again, uh, I want you to also look at the fact that these people are working long hours. Uh, they usually work uh, Monday through Saturday. Uh, uh, during the summertime, they're working eight, ten, ten hours a day. Uh, but on, on the weekend, I mean, on Sundays, they will always get together to have fun. Uh, and a lot of them, you know, yes, imagine their, their braceros work living in Montevideo, they're living in Sanibel, they're living in uh, Milpito, they're living uh, in the surrounding areas. And they all come to downtown San Jose to celebrate because uh, this is really the old Mexican pueblo where they have all kinds of interesting things. They have the Liberty Theater, which they can go and see Mexican movies. They have uh, bars, they have cantinas, they have restaurants. And so, it's, it's so, so for them, you know, even though they work a lot, there's also plenty of joy. Keep in mind that a lot of these individuals are basically in the early 20s. A lot of them are single. And so they, they, they want to go out and have, uh, have fun. In fact, uh, a lot of them actually meet a lot of young Mexican-American women, and they eventually fall in love. And that's the reason why once the contracts expire, they always come back as undocumented workers, and, and, and obviously they're going to come in and get married to this young uh, Mexican woman. Next. Um, again, uh, they're having fun right there. Next. OK. Uh, the, other thing, the reason why I picked this one is because the idea that workers are here to pick their harvest, and in a way they, 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 uh, they're like little machines that are there to do a, a function, and once, the, and once that thing is over, they are supposed to move on to the next job, and so that's, that's pretty, pretty revealing to me. Next. Uh, again, you have uh, the local uh, business groups starting to welcome uh, the Mexican Braceros. One of the reasons why I picked this, uh, this photo is because if you look at the Bracero uh, there, he's got to be in his 40s. Okay? And so what that tells me, is that, and he speaks, and he actually speaks quite a bit of English. So what that tells me is that this individual that came to the United States in the 1920s probably was one of those people that got, that got repatriated in the 1930s and now they're coming back. Okay? And, I'm, and I'm sure that these people are kind of shocked that this guy knows how to speak to them in their own language. Next. Okay, uh, again, uh, this incredible 
shortage and there aren't enough workers uh, that are being brought from Mexico, so there's a, there's a need to uh, basically uh, to uh, ration off the workers. Next. Um, again, uh, they're coming here to work. This is 1944, 1945, by the way. Next. One of the things that I, that I wanted to find, and this is interesting, I wanted to realize, we usually talk about Roceros, but there are also thousands and thousands of Mexican-Americans that are working in the fields, okay? And, uh, and a lot of these are kids uh, that are working on, this is actually the prunes, uh, but I said that God that they're working in prunes because it's very difficult work, and I think only families can do that. But here you have you know, the role of, of young Mexican-American kids uh, working in the fields. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, school does not start until uh, late in October to make sure that the crop is in. Okay, so you have the kids coming in. Yeah, next. Um, again, uh, you know, the, if, if the crops don't come in time, there's a problem here because uh, they might not be sufficient workers, and again, they, can, they may have to delay the start of school for, uh, and obviously, you're going to have a lot of kids working in the fields. Next. <laughs> By 1952, uh, uh, Professor Camarillo told you that. Uh, that workers could only work in our culture or, uh, or railroads, but that railroads only were, or, were only there for, for the time of the, the duration of, of World War II. But here you have workers are being taken away from farmers because they're being misused. One of the things that the, that the general wanted to make sure is that this work is not compete with, uh, uh, with the white Americans. So that if, if this, this uh, farmer got caught uh, using it for, to do uh, carpentry, and so these workers were, were removed from his field for his farm. Okay. Next. Again, uh, Professor Camarillo told you that in no circumstances were workers supposed to be used, Brazilians were supposed to be used to, uh, to break strikes. And here, there's plenty of evidence here that in fact they're being used to work. And this is one of the biggest complaints that Ernesto Galarza was making. In, 19, in the 1950s, he was busily organizing farm workers across the, United, uh, across the American, uh, actually California, and he got very frustrated because every time that he, he, that, he was that, he, that he was having a successful strike, the U.S. government would not hesitate in, co in collaboration with uh, growers to bring in uh, Braceros and break the strike. And clearly, this is a violation of the contract. Thank you. Next. Um, the bot and how this is the beginning of the end. Of, uh, uh, of the Bracero program, 1963, next. Um, again, people began to study, what are we gonna do without Braceros? Are we gonna be able to function? Keep in mind that agriculture is a, a significant economic sector of the California economy. Uh, if, without these workers, you know, you're gonna have around, you know, the American, the California economy, basic going and drawings. Uh, so this study in here, next. Um, there are some Bracelos by 19, uh, sorry, the Thunder by 1963 who are really thinking of uh, finally giving up uh, the, uh, the Bracelo program. Keep in mind that one of the persons most effective in, in bringing about the end of the Bracelo program is Ernesto uh, Galarza, who testified before different bodies of Congress, basically insisting that the Bracelo program must, must end uh, and that uh, you, know, you have to uh, make sure that you protect American workers. Next. Uh, but see, here you have the growers in Salinas basically becoming very fearful of what would happen in case there are no Braceros to pick. And keep in mind that in Salinas, they're, they're bringing in thousands of workers, 10, 15,000 workers from Mexico to, 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 pick, to uh, pick the crops. And here the survey the growers are saying, what happens if they don't come? Next. Uh, again, they're trying to figure out what to do in case there are no workers. Next. Um, should you use youth to take the place of workers? And obviously, the study here says no, uh, the growers are you know, basically adamantly opposed to using youth because they don't work as hard and then as sufficient of workers as Mexican work, uh, workers. Next. Uh, by this time, uh, I obviously, Galarza, Nessa Galarza is saying you know, that the investor program is ending uh, and that there's probably one more year left of it. Okay, next. 
Uh, again, the question is what? You know, here you have to look at the, at the Mercury News, basically, as being a, a spokesperson for the uh, farmers. They're, they're, they're pushing all these articles because they think that this is a major issue for readers and also for, for farmers. Next. Again, uh, uh, here you have uh, people saying we need to decide what's going to happen to the recycle program. Are we going to have it or not? Next. Even uh, Governor Brown uh, 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 is, is getting involved. He, he's appealing to, to Washington to continue the recycle program. Next. Uh, and they do, Brazil do come back. Okay? They keep coming back in 1964, 1965, and you're know, surprised to see that in fact. Uh, whereas the Brazil program is in 1964, Brazil will continue to come in. Next. <coughs> Again, uh, the rec farm workers do not want worker, uh, student workers because they're not as sufficient as the Mexican Braceros. Next. A thousand Braceros come to pick the, the, the berry crop. Okay, next. And then by 1967, this is interesting. Uh, uh, the Brasero had ended in 1965, but Braceros are coming in 1967. And finally, okay, uh, by 1967, the growers themselves have basically realized that the Brasero uh, program is basically at an end. Uh, they're no longer demanding, they're no, they're no longer pressing that the, 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 the program continues. One of the things you need to consider is perhaps one of the reasons why uh, they're no longer wanted is because by this time, you also have thousands of former Braceros okay, who had come back to Mexico okay, or not coming back as undocumented farm workers. And, and so there was no reason for them to continue the program when it's like you just hire undocumented workers. And so this is the end. Thank you. Mm -hmm.